think we should get started, right? Um, so the showing of the papers on the screen will be handled by uh, Johanna or Lasse. I hope so. By me, by me. Excellent. So welcome uh, everybody to this uh, uh, short session on uh, reconstruction, image reconstruction and clinical data. Um, I'm one of the chairs, Bram van Ginneke from Radboud UMC in Nijmegen. And my co-chair is Nietzsche Dvornek. You want to introduce yourself, Nietzsche? Yes, sir. Yes, my name sir. is Nietzsche Dvornek. Uh, I'm from Yale University. Thank you all for being here. I understood that we do this in groups of three papers at a time. Maybe one of the hosts can uh, take that up and then we can start with the first three papers. Um, and just a quick reminder for attendees that uh, please feel free to enter any questions into the chat and include the paper ID so we can help match it to the speaker. Thanks. Exactly. So I think everybody here has uh, one and a half minute, if I'm correct, to um, outline the key parts of the paper and then we do uh, the questions when all three presentations have, uh, have finished. It's all new okay. for us. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So, hello all, my name is Alexander, uh, and I want to present our collaborative study um, with collaboration between the High State University and Skolkovo Institute of Science and Technology about atrial fibrillation. This disease is the leading cause of stroke, and its sources are usually poorly visualized in the clinical practice by the technique called multi-electrode mapping. There is another technique called optical mapping, which has much higher resolution, but cannot be used in clinic. And we created image-to-image -image approach, which between these two modalities, uh, where firstly we trained on the data from expanded hearts and then tested on the in vivo cases of atrial fibrillation. And we found that um, the, the atrial fibrillation pattern is better visualized on the synthetic optical mapping images. And if you want to hear more about our study, please ask your questions and I'm glad to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions for this paper are welcome uh, in the chat. Um, and then we move to the second uh, presentation of the first three. Uh, I think it will be presented by Paul Weiser. Hello, thank you very much. Um, my name is Paul Weiser. I'm a PhD student at the Medical University of Vienna. Uh, in our work, um, we um, present uh, the reconstruction and coil combination of undersampled concentric ring MRSI data um, using a graph unit. Therefore, in our paper, we proposed and evaluated the graph neural network with a rather classic unit architecture. The model was compared to a regular PNN, and we found that this leads to improved results. In detail, a lower mean square error, a more stable training and validation loss. Please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, and then the third teaser is by um, Dr. Chatterjee on uh, residual learning. Hi, I'm, I'm Shalmik. I'm from Otto von Goethe University, Magdeburg, Germany. And in this work, we are um, uh, performing undersample reconstruction for both Cartesian and radial MRI uh, with uh, the framework called NCC1701, named after Star Trek Enterprise. And uh, the network is the Recon ResNet, which is a modified version of uh, residual net or ResNet architecture. Uh, in this one, we compared our method against unit architecture and um, it also against compress sensing. And uh, in the extended version of this work, we have also compared against uh, with clinical data for pathologies. And uh, the network seems to be robust for different undersampling patterns and different uh, amount of undersamplings. And we have tested for up to 20 undersampling factor of 20 for Cartesian and 17 for radio. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact me. And also the code is available on GitHub. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. 
Um, so I also would like to point out that right after this session, there's a poster session where you can go to all these individual authors if you want to ask them something in person or discuss something. So it's really recommended. Um, I think now uh, we have seven minutes to discuss the three papers. Um, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat. Uh, I would like to start with uh, the first paper about uh, deriving this high resolution ex vivo data from the low resolution data. Um, I think that is an extremely challenging problem and therefore extremely interesting. And I was wondering if you did a study to see how much of the low resolution data you need to still reliably make some kind of estimate of the high resolution data. Are, are you sure you have enough uh, input data to solve this challenging problem? Thank you for your question. That's a very good question. I'm not quite sure that we have a strict and robust answer on it, but we think that um, our data set, which is now consists of the more than uh, 200 expanded hearts, this program existed, uh, is existed in the Ohio State University for more than 10 years. And we want to, right now, this small short paper is based only on seven hearts but we want to expand it on the all hearts we have, and it's as much as we have, right? So it's not a good answer on it. How much do we need? But we we want to do um, as much as it's possible for, for this year, for 2021. Yeah, I had a small follow-up question because this is a really interesting data set. Is, is there any plan to share the data with the research community? I hope yes, but it's a lot of restrictions because it's from the medical Baxter Medical Center of the Ohio State University, and this is a lot of um, re reviewing board, and so many other other people are involved in this collection. So hopefully yes, hopefully yes. Okay, are there questions from the audience? Um, I don't see any, so. Uh... I have one other question. So how, how does this um, modality relate um, to using CT or MRI to look at atrial fibrillation? Uh, yes, thank you for your question. Um, we, did, we don't use CT, but MRI, it's very important, uh, but in, in, in a little bit um, different uh, style because both mappings, optical and electrodes, are looking for a functional functional uh, data, how the electricity uh, moves around the heart. And about the MRI, it cannot look, it, it cannot look the electricity, but we can um, get the location of the arrhythmogenic hubs inside the heart, maybe some type of fibrosis, some type of fats, and it will be great to combine these two approaches together. It will be our next step, I hope. So okay. MRI is, is a good is a good solution. Yeah, in the interest of time, I think we should go to the the second paper by Paul Weiser, and that is about uh, about MRI. Um, my my question for that paper would be, um, what clinical application would you like to address with uh, with this technique? Because MR spectroscopy is is still not not widely used and. I think you only used simulated data in this paper. Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Can you comment on that? Yes, of course. So um, the data was acquired in our center by a Siemens 7 Tesla scanner. Uh, three Tesla, sorry. And like, we scanned ourselves. So the, the, the data was acquired by the people in our institute. Um, and the clinical application. So at the end of the day, um, we're, we're, we're currently working just to get this, this to run and to work, and then maybe in the future we can implement it into the scanner and see see what happens. I think that's the next step in the future. Good. Any other questions for Paul? If not, let's uh, discuss the, the third paper on uh, regularized residual learning. Um, there's one question from the audience. Do you have a comparison against state-of-the-art deep learning models in the field? Because in the paper, you only show UNET, and UNET may over-smooth. So um, could you comment on uh, alternative approaches for the UNET? 
Yeah, so we have also compared against uh, Varnet, so the variational network, and apart from that was UNIT. And uh, in the, the paper, we just have the unit comparison and also the comparison against compass sensing. I was also wondering if you tried other data modalities because this, uh, you showed only brain in the short paper, right? Uh, yes, uh, we just used brain images, yes. Um, but we used uh, in the long paper, like the journal version, we also used um, uh, the ICSI data set apart from OSS and also um, pathological data. So there was BRATS data where there was tumor to check whether we can uh, reconstruct the tumor properly. And also we used uh, Alzheimer data from um, the RD data set. Also for the same thing that we wanted to compare that uh, if the brain volume is preserved properly or not, because the network never saw any kind of pathologies and the trainings were only done with healthy subjects. And, and how did you look at the fast MRI challenge with knee data? Uh, no, actually, uh, in the extent, not in, uh, part of this uh, work, but an extension of this work was directly working in the case space, which we presented at ISMRM uh, this year. And in that work, we used fast MRI brain data set. Uh, and that was uh, basically a similar approach, but directly working in the case space rather than working in the MS space. Which of the two approaches do you think in the long term will be most promising? In my opinion, would be the case space best approach. Because the hypothesis is that uh, in the image space, if there is some um, uh, small structure which is completely obscured by artifacts, in the image space, if we are trying to correct it, in, in theory, we're just correcting the corrupted images, it will still be there and it will not be able to recover those really tiny structures hidden by those artifacts. But when we are doing in the case space, we're just trying to predict the missing points and there is no such obscurity involved in that case. And uh, we, in that approach, we are using CVCNN, so complex cell contribution. And I feel like that would be definitely the future way to go. Yeah, thanks a lot for your comments. I think we will hear a lot about uh, this type of uh, algorithms uh, in the future. And I really like your background. You're in some kind of a science fiction spaceship or- uh... It's from Star Trek Enterprise. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Then I think we, in the interest of time, have, move, have to move to the next three papers. Uh, Nanita, you will take over, right? Yes, thank you. Um, do we have our first speaker in this set, Mikhail? Oh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, can I start? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, my name is Mikhail. I'm presenting our work on ultra low dose CT denoising in the projections. Um, as you know, CT acquisition consists of two steps. Uh, first is the planning step, capture of so called uh, scout or topogram. And uh, only then, after planning, uh, it captures diagnostic 3D scan itself. Uh, planning in 2D has its limitations, like it's harder to distinguish between overlapping organs and tissues. And to make planning more informative, our idea is to perform it in 3D. So we call it 3D scouts, and we are trying to make it with the same low dose as 2D scanning. Uh, and uh, so those is approximately 1% of the full CT. Therefore, uh, resulting images suffer from strong artifacts and noise. Mm. And to deal with this, we propose the noisy and convolutional neural network in the projection domain. Projection data is more interesting because it contains more information and some artifacts are easier to remove in, than in reconstructed images. So in addition to this, we compare two data representations, uh, like more raw data and more like uh, somehow converted one. And as a result, we show that uh, proposed approach is capable to create clean 1% those CT images, but uh, it still requires some additional development. Yeah, I'm, and I will glad to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could we please have our next speaker, Emmanuel? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Um, let's see the video. Well, apparently my video is not working, but we go on like this, okay? <laughs> uh, so, hello everyone. I am Emmanuel Sebedusi. I'm a PhD researcher at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, in the Netherlands. So, uh, for MRL exometry, as is the case for most applications, uh, the definition of a regularizer is really non-trivial. Uh, the prior distribution is intrinsically linked to the parametric maps that we don't have access to. 
and the optimal regularization strength uh, depends on the noise level of the acquired data. In this paper, uh, we demonstrate the usefulness of the recurrent inference machines for MRL exometry. The RIM is a recurrent neural network that learns an iterative optimization strategy very similar to a regularized gradient descent approach. This framework uh, uses a likelihood function to enforce the data consistency and is able to learn an efficient prior that generalizes well for different noise levels. We compared the RIM to a maximum likelihood estimator and an implementation of the ResNet in experiments with simulated data. We showed that the RIM is able to improve the estimation precision of the relaxometry maps without significant degradation of their accuracy. So to conclude, uh, the RIM is a promising method for MR lexometry, and because of the framework learns an inference method based on a likelihood function, we expect it to also generalize well to unseen data, such as in vivo data sets. Well, I'm looking forward to your questions and all the discussions during the poster session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and finally, we have Farah. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so my name is uh, Farah and I'm an assistant professor emerging scholar at NYU Abu Dhabi. And I'm going to present the work that was done in collaboration between NYU School of Medicine, NYU Center for Data Science and myself at NYU Abu Dhabi. So in our work, we were interested in developing a system that would predict um, in hospital clinical deterioration, specifically in emergency departments within 24 to 96 hours from the time of prediction. And for that, we used um, chest X-ray images uh, that were collected from COVID-19 patients in the emergency department, as well as uh, clinical data extracted from electronic health records. So in this work, we used uh, on the figure, the figure on the right shows the network that we used to process the chest X-ray images. It's based on the globally aware multiple instance classifier. And then we use a late fusion approach to combine the predictions uh, computed using the chest x-rays and the clinical variables separately. Uh, we also had some work inspired by survival analysis and we uh, conducted a reader study with um, two radiologists. The code is published on GitHub and uh, since the submission to this conference, the paper also got published. So I'm happy to take any questions uh, after the presentation or during the poster session. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, again, if you have any questions, please enter them into the chat. And uh, we can now open up the panel for a discussion. Um, in the chat, we have a question for Mikhail. Uh, what is the overall difference in the results between working on photons versus working on the line integrals? Yeah, overall difference is that uh, photon data tends to create more sharper image, yet not removing all the noise, uh, since the noise property is slightly different than in online integrals. So it's kind of trade-off. Uh, we, we may choose which data representation fits our needs in images. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I had a follow-up question on that from my study group where we discussed this paper. Um, so what is actually the most important to get right in this uh, 3D scout view? Because you use the scout view for those uh, modulation, I understood. So yes. is, is it at all that relevant that the noise is removed? Can you, can you comment on that? Uh, so maybe, maybe I don't get it completely. So yeah, and, and we, we definitely use it for those planning uh, during the scan. But uh, what, what, what do you mean? So how, how completely should we remove the noise? Yeah, since it's not... Um, it's not a diagnostic scan, Yeah, right? it's not diagnostic scan. So it's uh, it's okay if some noise will be there. But yeah, it still should be like enough sufficient quality for radiologists to, un to understand what is happening. So yeah. Um, yeah, but but radiologists typically don't look at the scout views, right? So they're just used to plan the, yeah. uh, the diagnostic uh, acquisition. Yeah, you're right. I, and related to that, I was wondering, um, because you're using 1% of the total do dose, what if the exam itself is already a low dose exam, right? Because Philips and other vendors are, are saying we can now make CT scans with like only a few percent of the original dose if you want to go ultra low dose. Would you then still make a scout view from 1% of this very low dose? Or how do you see that? 
Oh, it's, it's interesting question. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not so uh, in this like business development <laughs> thing, I, but I, I think it's possible to do this as a like at least for uh, scanning or I mean mm -hmm. for uh, can for lung cancer for screening pur purposes. Yeah, it's, it's for such low doses, pretty good. Well, could be. I mean, <laughs> yeah, for, not not completely for diagnostic, but yeah, for screening purposes it's fine yeah clear um want to move to the next paper or shall i do one more question on this one i think we have time for one more question okay there was there was um, a question and uh, that somewhere in the paper you say you want to remove biases and increase robustness um yeah. Yeah. how would you do that or can you maybe talk a bit about further improvements to the method you presented yeah, we used pretty familiar DNCNN network, uh, removing for all the biases from it and batch norm layers even. Uh, therefore, network became less sensitive to <clears throat> to absolute values of the noise and the as an input uh, and more generalizable. So, um, yeah, our goal was to make the network uh, to like less sensitive to auto distribution data. And, so yeah. Great, thank okay. you. Um, I'm looking forward to always having 3D scout views. We'll uh, <laughs> we'll see if it uh, if it really materializes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, I have a question for Emmanuel. Um, so you compared your approach to uh, maximum likelihood estimates, uh, and I noticed that uh, for the the relative biases, those like tend to shrink as expected for the higher SNR for MLE, but then this didn't seem to be the case for either of the neural network models. And I was wondering if you could um, explain why you think that is, or what you could do to maybe improve the the bias. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question. Well, I, I appear here now. I don't know what happened. Before. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> so I think that's a very valid point and. In all that evaluation, the CSF tissue, the, all the CSF area of the brain was also included. And uh, because of the way the simulation data was set up to train the networks, um, we didn't really pay much attention on uh, the precise, uh, the accurate estimation of the CSF. Uh, because uh, the range is very different between the tissue, so it's a bit hard to uh, accommodate everything under the same uh, neural network framework. So I believe those the higher variation uh, comes mainly from the CSF tissues, parts of the, uh, the CSF uh, in the brain, uh, and the interface between those tissues, between CSF and gray matter or CSF and white matter. Uh, and I believe this is the reason why this range of relative bias is larger uh, than the MLE. It is. And since it's, it seems like a fairly large range, like maybe up to 10%, um, do you have a sense of whether that's an acceptable level of error for these maps? Uh, that depends on the application you want to use uh, this method for, right? If you are, um, if the CSF, the T1 mapping of the CSF carries uh, some diagnostic value for your application, yeah, I think this should be uh, rethought and uh, the synthetic data that we use to train should be more carefully generated in that sense. But for uh, our proof of concept, uh, work here. Mm -hmm. uh, we did not, admittedly, did not pay much attention to the CSF estimation because we were more interested in the tissues themselves. But yes. I, I do believe uh, there is importance in it if the, the application demands it. I see. Thank you. Yeah, in my study group, we discussed this paper, and a question was uh, all these architectural choices that you made, uh, why did you make those? Um, one that, that I found interesting was that you use 40 by 40 patches, which seems rather small to me. Mm -hmm. Is this just because this is what you started with, or do you have ideas uh, um, is really optimal? For most of the, uh, let's go to the hyperparameters of the network, starting there. Uh, we ran some ad hoc experiments to, to evaluate which uh, configuration of parameters would be best, uh, would, would learn better the, the inverse problems. 
And related to the patch size, it, this was strictly uh, a memory limitation. <laughs> uh, the network model was quite big. Since it's a recurrent neural network, it kind of stacks up in the memory. Uh, so if we wanted to run with a batch size of five or more, we needed small patches. But interestingly, uh, when we evaluated this model in full size images, 200 by 200, 300 by 300, the network is scaled no problem. So that was quite nice to see as well. Good. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Um, and for Farah, uh, I have a question about uh, your, your model. So if I understood correctly, the, the model outputs um, the ROI patches from the saliency maps, and then you use that for the local module. Mm -hmm. um, could you uh, explain what's the size for the ROI patches and how you determine this, and did this um, greatly affect the model performance? Yes, sure. So um, the ROI patches, they were retrieved through a greedy algorithm from the CLC maps. And the way we determined the size was also through just uh, ablation studies where we looked at a couple of different sizes and the most optimal one was 224 by 224 and it did help um i mean we didn't really design the architecture here as much as we applied it for our application because the original paper is the one that combined the um, global module with the local module and the fusion module and in the original paper they did compare um, relying just on the global module versus relying on the uh, fused approach, and that did improve the performance. But we didn't do those comparisons in our paper um, in this round, yeah. I see, thanks. Um, and some of the reviewers were interested in hearing more about the details for the clinical attributes uh, and the, mm -hmm. the GVM model. Could you explain that a bit more? Yes, definitely. So for the GBM model, we used um, vital sign variables, so heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, respiratory rate. Um, and we also used um, routine lab test results, so white blood cell count, et cetera. And the performance actually, the performance gains mainly relied on vital signs in this context. But what's interesting here is that it, that, the reason why vital signs are more predictive here is because the labs weren't frequently collected uh, within the ED before our prediction, because our prediction is based on every, every time a chest x-ray is collected, our model would compute a prediction. And when the patients come to the ED, they actually get their lab tests collected, but the results only come out four hours later. And therefore, the lab tests were mainly missing for our application. Um, but as I mentioned, it was mainly vitals and labs, but in the context of this application, vitals were more predictive, mainly for the reason of availability of data, because pre-COVID, most early warning score systems actually relied on vital sign variables. Um, but increasingly, these models are now starting to incorporate labs, and in our work, we're interested in seeing the role of imaging. Yeah. Did, did you also have CT data? There was a question in my study group. Uh, I think the hospital, did NY, the School of Medicine at NYU definitely has CT, but uh, in our study, we were mainly interested in x-rays. I think there was another group working on CT scans. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, okay. in the interest of time, we move to the final three papers. And we have Dr. Mugliari or a colleague presenting the first paper on prototypical brains. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Ahmad Wisnu Mulyadi, a PhD student from Korea University. Our research proposed propose the framework called the Proto Brain Maps for tackling the Alzheimer's disease progression modeling via uh, prototype learning. Uh, we integrate the deep generative models and clustering network. Also, we impose the framework to establish a set of prototype units in the latent space of brain MRI, guided by the clinical information, such as the cl clinical stage, as well as the cognitive score. And based on the preliminary experimental result on the ADNI data set, we were able to establish such prototypes and also able to generate set of uh, well-interpolated 3D prototypical brains simulating how the Alzheimer's disease progress on brain morphological changes. 
and then uh, hopefully we can use that as the potential feature to be further be used in the downstream task. Uh, that's all. To throw me any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And the next person to present is Nella Bloom, uh, talking about metal artifact reduction. Hello, and welcome to my short introduction of projection domain artifact reduction in computer tomography using conditional generated Bethesda networks. I'm Nira Bloom from the Institute of Medical Engineering at the University of Quebec. And today I'd like to present you a new approach to reduce metal artifacts in CT images by applying a new network directly to the measure projection data. So the measure projection data, which are corrupted by the high density objects, are considered as missing data. We can see here on the left side as a white and white uh, metal trace, and the network should learn this missing image information. Thus, uh, the network is, is the input data, the protection data with the missing metal traces, and the corresponding binary mass of the metal trace. For the network architecture, we use a conditional generator adversarial network with a two stage generator net architecture consisting of a curse and a fine network. And the corrected uh, protection data by the trained generator network can then be used in different reconstruction approaches, which we can see on the top. And thus, we can also get uh, the reduced meta artifact image in the image domain. On the right side, we can see our results for the uh, simulated test data set. And we can see in the top line um, the input data with the sinogram and the missing meta trace and the artifact image. And we can see that our proposed method is performing extremely well. And it's also outperforming the linear population where we still have some artifacts in the sinogram. And so our results look quite promising. And the next step would be to test our network also on real clinical data. So if you have any questions, please ask. And I also try to answer more details in the poster session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then our final presentation is by Dr. Simko, uh, also about uh, MRI mapping uh, like one of the previous papers. Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Attila, and in our work, we have collected 100 MR volumes from one of these five contrasts that you can see on the poster. And uh, we set up a categorical GAN to retrospectively transfer from one contrast to another. And the setup is simple, it works fine, but our main contribution is how we can define what contrast the generator should output, because on this image, this is not yet defined. Uh, in our design, our generator is a unit with three output layers, and we add supervision by combining these three layers with, a, with an operation that mimics the signal equations for spin echo sequences. And with this choice, we get three things. One is that the target's contrast is defined by inputting the echo and repetition times in a physically meaningful way, which is really useful for machine learning solutions. The second is that we can transfer to any contrast that we want. And the third is, at, is that the three layers inside the unit will uniquely define the proton density, the T1 and the T2 relaxation times, uh, although they are not known from the training data whatsoever. Uh, we have tested transferring to the five contrasts that are included in the training data, but of course the model is not limited to these contrasts. And in fact, for only a single input image, the model can return the proton density T1 and T2 maps with surprising accuracy. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting work. So then we have time to discuss all the three papers. Uh, let's start with the prototypical brain paper. Um, the first one that was presented here. Um, what one of the things we were wondering about is how you would validate your uh, prototypes because this is difficult, right? If you do some kind of extraction of an uh, an average trajectory from a large data set. Yes, currently uh, we evaluate only for the qualitative results. So it means that we just uh, evaluate how the morphological, morphological changes progress. And for the other uh, like evaluation, so we we uh, we will uh, like evaluate in the like uh, downstream tasks for the like classification tasks or the uh, cognitive score uh, prediction. But uh, that will be our uh, future work. So how, how would you do that? Would you simply map um, an MRI scan on your uh, 
trajectory and then say mm. you are there so this is your cognitive score uh, or? yeah for uh for the any unseen uh, mr sample so we will encode that into the latent features and then just calculate the uh, distance or the similarity between the unseen samples with one each of each of the prototypes and then we can uh, use additional classifier to get the output that's uh, one of our proposal yeah another thing we were wondering is that you now have one trajectory but yeah. patients vary a lot right so you could maybe also try to find multiple valid trajectories through this space did you consider that Yes, we have considering that one also. So, but uh, one of the alternative is to apply like two D topology topological grid instead of one D. So we have some variance to that. Then uh, that can accommodate the variance of the uh, people uh, populations. Okay, so that will be next steps. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Then let's move to the metal artifact uh, reduction. One question that came up in my study group was about the the 128 by 128 uh, patches that that the method uh, is using. Isn't that a limitation? Uh, I think not because uh, so we have the 3D sinogram data, and I think if we use this 3D sinogram data, they're quite big for the geometry, so this would be a problem. And with uh, this reduced patch size, of course, um, the network can learn better uh, or faster also and with less memory and also it can't remember um, the image itself or the projection itself so i think we see here an advantage more than a disadvantage but of course um, maybe some information also get lost and you mentioned using it on on real data did, did you already try that or what would you expect to happen then um we did not try this at the moment but we planned it in um, some Future, so not uh, so far, um, but I think we should have problems with noise images. So um, at the moment we have, of course, no noise in the images, and also some uh, metal objects are quite hard to segment. Uh, like if you have these uh, metal implants, there is the uh, segmentation much harder, and you have less information. And so I think the network is performing much worse than it's uh, for the simulated data. Yeah, so the segmentation is a challenge, right? You also yeah. need to decide how far you want to go there. Every object that might cause a little bit of artifact or only the the real metal objects, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good luck. That was very interesting work. Thank you. Thank you. Let me check in the chat. And then we have some time left for the final paper, which was a, a full paper. Um, I thought it was very fascinating work. And what, what I was wondering, um, when I, when I read the paper is you all, you trained this model with these five different contrast settings, uh, echo times, right? How do you think the, the final result that you get depends on that choice? What if you would have had 15 settings or, or only three? Uh, can you give your ideas on that? Uh, yes, uh, we selected the training data set to cover a wide range of echo and repetition times. And uh, based on the results, I think we did a good job. But if you look at the results for the T2 relaxation times, they are kind of on the lower side compared to the proton density and the T2, T1 maps, which are really accurate. So I think that that was uh, due to the, well, not enough uh, training data or maybe not covering enough echo and repetition times. So now we're collecting more data with uh, a wider range of contrast, and hopefully that will improve the T2 results. Yeah, excellent. I was also wondering, like in MRI, you have these field inhomogeneities, right? Doesn't that, um, how, how does that affect your model? Uh, very good question. I think uh, if you if you look at the images, if you transfer the image to a different contrast, it will keep the bias field of the original image. So it will not transform that bias in any way. And we're actually doing a synthetic CT study using these contrast transfer model. And it does a really good job if you're using two contrasts because the bias fields are the same if you if you retrospectively transfer to a different contrast. So it's actually a good 
good property of them. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, very nice. If you would apply this to a different body part, would you have to retrain everything or? Yes, we tried and we do. Excellent. Let me see if there are more, more questions. I had, I had another question on the uh, reference. You choose muscle and bladder, but you also chose prostate as a reference region. And I think the prostate is quite inhomogeneous. So I was wondering if that's a, a clever choice. Uh, that was, let's say, peer pressure from the department because we focus a lot on the prostate. So we wanted to see how well it performs on that anatomy. Yeah, but if, if that, that reference area is inhomogeneous, then, then it sort of violates the assumptions you're making, right? Yes. Uh, yes. Any more questions? Um, I have a quick question. Uh, just more generally, um, do you have a sense for what level of air is acceptable for generating these synthetic MRI and, and how would you go about um, validating that? Uh, I'm afraid I don't understand. So, so the goal here is to, to generate different contrasts, right, of, of the MRI and how how do we know that it's good enough compared to actually taking the, the different contrast MRI? Requiring oh, yes, that's a, that's a good question. I guess the best we can do is give it to radiologists and ask them. So I, so I don't like think a large the validation quantitative, study. yeah, I don't think the quantitative uh, measures that we present here are enough for clinically acceptable results or to say that we have clinically acceptable results. I think the best we can do is give it to the experts and ask them yes or no. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for this work and I uh, hope you can take it forward. Um, that brings us to the end of the session. So after this, the poster session starts. So the everybody who has presented in this uh, session will go to their posters and you can ask them further questions there. I would like to thank everybody for their participation, also the study groups who raised a lot of the questions that we asked. And uh, I think this concludes the session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And let's thank all the speakers. Yeah.